morning. Good morning. We welcome you all to our service today for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. And if you've looked at the bulletin already, the introduction for today, the idea of a uh, Christian being blessed is very much a part of our lessons, particularly the gospel <coughs> lesson for the day. And as we begin, well, let's see, the little kids aren't here today. Is Emily hiding back there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Emily, did you want to come up, or should we just do everything from up here today? And, and use all the adults as our children. Of course, you base girl, you what you do as our children. But you're grown up by now. Emily, how are you? I'm going to put something over here, okay? So you're going to have to watch over here. Okay. Two glasses. Pitcher of water. What's the difference between this glass and that glass? Oh. Do you think, do you think I could put any more water in this one? But I could put it in there. Okay. Which one do you think represents a Christian? Take a guess. The full one? Let's, let's see what they say too. See if they get the right one. Which one represents the Christian? They're all afraid to answer. <laughs> I think it's the full one. You think it's the full one? That's what I think. The empty grass without Christ. Yeah, but I said it's the Christian. Oh. See, so that he does have Christ. Which one represents the Christian? Are you sure? Do you think they're right? Oh, you're changing your mind now, the empty one. Let me read you something. You think about this. This is from the Gospel lesson today. Blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, are you like this? Or are you like this? Okay, why does that represent? Now this is a little bit different than we normally think, but this is Jesus' words to us today. Why would this represent the Christian? Because it has none of the God's spirit yet. I wouldn't say not. But when we recognize that we are hungry and thirsty for the good things that only Christ can give to us, because as sinners, we are actually empty of all that. See, there are a lot of people who think they're filled with all kinds of good things. That's why the water is dark here. All right? They think they have the holiness and the righteousness uh, in and of themselves. All right? But what Jesus is telling us today is when we recognize that we are empty, guess what? Then he can fill us with his good graces and his gifts. So, a little bit different than normal. But the, in other words, the Christian who recognizes that he is nothing of himself, but that he is everything in Christ, then can be filled with all of Christ's blessings. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have granted us rich blessings, not in and of ourselves, but in Christ as our Savior. Help us to see the emptiness that we are without him, but at the same time, the fullness that you have given us through our faith in Jesus, so that now we have that perfect life of holiness and righteousness that we need before you. And although in this life we might not always show that to others, help us to see what you have made us in Christ so that we can reflect those kinds of gifts to others, the mercy, the peace, and the joy that you've given to us, we can reflect in our lives to that. Be with us today as we study your word. Give us your Holy Spirit to guide us and grow in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up, Emily. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Beginning thoughts for the service today, especially the gospel lesson. Today we follow the order of morning praise, or the matin service on page 45 in your hymnal, and that service begins with the singing of our opening hymn, Hymn 399.
Athens morning praise service on page 45. And we now begin towards the bottom of the page with the singing of the opening responses. <clears throat> We sing responsibly the psalm. We ask the congregation to sing the refrain portions. There are three of them. The second half of each of the verses, and then the glory be to the Father towards the end. Oh, yeah. 
Once again, epiphany means that the way it means for God's people is that the Savior that is born in the manger now is revealed in different ways as our Savior. Today, especially in the Gospel lesson, you notice that in the words that he speaks, how his words reflect only that which is from the Lord and can be understood from the Lord and the Lord fills his people with good things. So blessings are a big part of the lessons. Our Old Testament lesson from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. The prophet, very briefly ahead of this, had reviewed how Israel had gone apart from the Lord, and the Lord was calling them, you might say, into a courtroom to notice uh, the things, to see the things that are really true in what he had done for them. He had preserved them from their enemies, he had taken them out of Egypt, um, and yet they did not really recognize him. He wasn't even really very happy with the offerings that they brought because they brought them with hearts that were empty now of any thoughts of the Lord. And yet the Lord in his goodness is the one who will be their savior, will be the righteous one, and he informs them of what he does require in their hearts. Hearts of faith that show justice and love and kindness. We read in Micah chapter 6. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Here ends the word of our Lord from the Old Testament. Our epistle lesson is recorded in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. God works in different ways from the way the world would think of that. And those things that seem foolish to him, for example, how Christ dying on the cross is going to bring us forgiveness and eternal life when he dies, yet those are the means by which God brings about his salvation and blesses us with life in the Savior in whom we believe. We read in 1 Corinthians 1. For example, consider your call, brothers. Not many of you were wise from a human point of view. Not many were powerful, and not many were born with high status. But God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame those who are wise. God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are strong. And God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to do away with the things that are, so that no one may boast before God. But because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God, namely our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God did this so that, just as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here ends the reading of the epistle lesson. And we now ask the congregation to please rise for the reading of our gospel. The gospel lesson for today is recorded in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 1. It is the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and the opening verses are what are known as the Beatitudes, where he speaks of the blessed nature of the Christian who has emptied himself before the Lord to be filled with the Lord's grace. We read in Matthew 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up onto a mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. He said these things. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the gentle, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. In fact, that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The congregation may be seated as we now continue with the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 394. God's grace always shone through the clouds 
and lightened up the way, making things turn out for a blessing for me. Nevertheless, it is still my hope, and probably the hope of all parents who care for their children, that they will have a happier life, more productive life than theirs. Would any of you disagree with me, parents? And if that should be true of us, think of it being true of the greatest parent of all, our Heavenly Father. He is the perfect one. He is the holy one. He is the gracious one. He is the God of all love who calls himself love. If we who are sinful would wish only happy things upon our children, wouldn't he who is holy wish that for those whom he has created and made in his image through Christ? Yes, God wants us to be happy. Far from being the killjoy that many people almost paint him to be, God wants to save us from eternal sadness and make us happy in him. So the question is, are you one of the happy ones? You are if you see yourself for what you truly are before him. First of all, he points out, you are a sinner who has been turned a saint in Christ. And that governs everything and changes everything. Now Jesus begins, blessed, 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 nine times he uses that same word in these verses. It's almost like a continuously ringing bell shouting out very clearly what happens in the life of those who come to him through faith. These words are spoken to disciples, those who believe in him. Can't say that of everyone else, but of those who come to him, they are the truly happy ones. In fact, some translators choose the word, use the word happy here in place of probably what you have normally heard, blessed, blessed, blessed are they. And at least one translator wants to make the meaning even more vivid by saying, I don't know if he accomplishes it, but he says, you are the truly happy people, those who are spiritually poor. The truly happy people are those who are in great sorrow. The truly happy people are those who hung, are hungry and thirsty. You know, those are paradoxes, actually. <coughs> they seem contrary to what we would normally think if we think of the descriptions here. Truly happy people are poor. Truly happy people are crying. Truly happy people are thirsty. That doesn't seem right. <coughs> Think of that. One space hardly radiates happiness when the stomach is growling for food, or when the tears are flowing, or when poverty puts them out on the street. Those are not happy situations in the normal sense of the word. Yet Jesus said the truly happy people are those who are poor, mourning, and hungering, and so on. That's a little bit upside down, don't you think? Obviously, he has to be using those terms in a different way than they are normally taken. Most of the time, people think of happiness as a feeling that is governed within them by their outward circumstances in life. In other words, if I have lots of food, and if my belly is full, then I am happy. If I have enough money and my bank account is large, then I am happy. If I only experience what I consider as the good times in life, then I am happy. See, most people think of happiness in their lives as dictated by good outward circumstances. But Jesus is pointing to something else here. He's not pointing to outward circumstances that can so easily deceive us. He's pointing to inner realities within the person that must be seen before true happiness can be felt. <coughs> Not outward deceptions, but inward reflections of spiritual truths. In other words, before I can enjoy God's good blessings and true happiness, I must see myself or what I am on my own before him, a begging, mourning, meek, 
starving person. See, that's what sin makes me. I am poor in God's sight, not having the righteousness that is needed to be able to stand before him, begging for his help. I am sad. I am sorrowing over that which I have done against him, hungry to be filled with the forgiveness that only he can provide. I am a sinner in need of help. And God gives the help that I need in Christ my Savior. And when I see these things, then God lifts me up in Jesus and he makes me truly happy in a Savior. A sinner turned saint in Christ. One of the briefest, yet perhaps most or deepest theological truths that Martin Luther ever wrote was found in a little crumpled up note that said, we are all beggars. This is true. Now those words take on much more significance when you consider the circumstances under which he wrote them. They are said to be the last words from his pen. They were found scribbled on a scrap of paper crumpled up next to the bed on which he died. His last words, we are all beggars. This is true. How typical, both of the man and of the fullness of his understanding of the scriptures. A giant of church history, and yet his final words were a confession of his radical poverty and his unworthiness before Almighty God. But far from being words of anguish or despair, these were words actually of victory as Luther saw them in the light of his faith in Christ. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We do that on our own. There's no difference. There's no difference between prince and pauper. No difference between pastor or people. We all must see ourselves for what we truly are before God on our own. Spiritual beggars mourning the greatness of our sin. Starving for an ounce of his mercy. And here it comes to us in Christ. For there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> beggars, indeed, but beggars transformed into rich saints in Christ, filled with his righteousness, comforted by his forgiveness, finding joy in our present existence, and looking forward to more of what God's kingdom has in store for us. Sinners turned saints. They're the blessed ones. And as such, they can become a blessing to others. That's where Jesus now goes with this, as he continues. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Now does that sound like you? I'm not sure that it sounds like me. For example, sometimes when I pray the Lord's Prayer, I shudder. And it happens when I get to words that are in the middle of the prayer. You know them well. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And what sometimes flashes before my eyes at that time is the times that I have failed to forgive others. So does that mean that my sins won't be forgiven? Does that mean that God's mercy on me depends on my mercy, the mercy that I show to others, or rather, the things that I have not shown to them? How about pure in heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says, for they will see God. I'm not sure that's I. Pure in heart? What about you? I know that I think some very nice thoughts at times in my heart. But could I say that my heart is pure, without any sin, never quarreling, 
never at odds with others, always at peace with them. I have not been that at all times. Have you? Is there any reason for our happiness here? Yes. Yes, because the important truth and the one that guides the whole Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus speaks these words throughout his sermon to his disciples. Jesus speaks these words to those who have come to him empty of things things and believe in him as their savior. He speaks to those who are beggarly in spirit, who confess their sins to God and cling to this truth that their <coughs> sins are washed away completely in the blood of Christ so that they are, in that sense, pure and cleansed in heart before him. Just like John the Baptist said, he is the lamb that takes away all our sin. That's who we are as believers in the sight of God. A sinner turns saint, and that truth makes one happy. Through Christ you are pure in heart, even amidst the things that we do, through your faith in the Savior. In sight of God you are pure in heart through him. Through Christ his peace rests on you, and that peace in the sight of God becomes seen in your life to others. Every word of peace, every reconciliation that Jesus has carried out, he's carried out on account of you. And by faith, then, you become the truly blessed. You are the happy ones in him. And since this is who you are in the sight of God, Jesus encourages us to strive to be also this way in the sight of others. Merciful, pure in heart, peace-loving. See, in Christ, you do become a blessing to others. But that doesn't mean you're always going to be received well by others. While considering that, I was reading a story about a World War II veteran who had survived the concentration camps. He said that the worst part of life in the camp wasn't what the guards did to the prisoners. It was what the prisoners did to one another. See, the guards had created within the camp kind of a separate world from everything else with a completely different set of rules to it. So that prisoners who showed exceptional cruelty and self-interest and willingness to betray others were the ones who were rewarded. And those who tried to keep a semblance of humanity and morality suffer. The survivors said that there was only one thing that determined whether the prisoners would follow the camps or the guards' rules. Those who believed that there was no chance of rescue lived according to those prison rules. Those who kept alive the hope of returning to the real world refused to live by the guards' rules. What's the connection? Christians refuse to live by the world's rules. For the world thinks nothing of God but only cares about itself and in getting ahead, often at the expense of others. In these verses, Jesus calls us to live in a way that is foreign to the world. A life of faith that finds it all, first of all, in Christ, and then reflects that outward. Such a life may bring persecution as a result. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. <coughs> See, the happy life in Christ does bring persecution. It brings insult, it brings slander. And that shouldn't surprise us. Jesus faced it, the prophets did, the apostles did too. Should we expect anything different? Now where is the happiness in that? What will be able to get us through that if it should happen? Well, that's found in Jesus' words. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
We live in this world for now, but this world is not the end of it. This is only a passing world. Heaven is our home. And there, we will enjoy in Christ a blessed life that never ends. The world that is only out for itself and rewards itself, rewarding the child of God with persecution, has no happiness in the end. For then comes the kingdom, the eternal reward, and those who are in Christ will receive that blessed life that never ends. I want my kids to know that and be happy. I want you to know that too and be happy. Most of all, God wants us to find our happiness and fulfillment at all times in a Savior that he's given. And when we come to that in faith, then we are truly blessed. God grant us that in faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as we join together in singing the song on page 48 in your hymnal. We praise you, O God.
We give thee but thy all, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Lord, you have revealed your blessings in our lives through Christ, and besides him, you grant us all we need day after day. We bring a portion of the gifts that you have given us to your altar today. We ask that you would bless them to your glory and to be used so that the gospel might be go out into the world and bring other souls to Christ. Be with us now, for in Jesus' name we give our offerings to you. Amen. And we now ask the congregation to please rise as we close this morning praise service on page 50 with the prayers and the blessings. Page 50. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations. Help us to empty ourselves of any pride or any righteous thoughts that we would have looking to ourselves so that you might fill us with the joys and the blessings of grace that are ours through faith in Christ. And be with many people throughout the world who have not come to know you yet as the Savior God May they see their emptiness too without Christ and use us in whatever way you can to bring the blessed news of the gospel to them so that they might be filled with the happiness that Christ brings. And O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all that we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us praise the Lord.
Again, we welcome all of you to our service.